Good morning, everyone, and a really warm welcome to this webinar uh, on tracking Sweden's consumption based environmental impacts. Uh, we're going to, for the next 90 minutes, look um, at the gaps and the opportunities um, for measuring um, consumption based environmental impacts and, and in light of what we need to do not just to achieve SDG 12 on responsible consumption and production, but I would say really all, all the SDGs in a way. Uh, my name is Osa Persson. I'm research director and deputy director at the Stockholm Environment Institute. And we are really delighted, very pleased to host this webinar today uh, on behalf of all the project partners of the PRINCE project. Uh, we are going to hear more about this uh, project in a little while. I will hand over to the project lead. Um, but let me first just uh, set the scene a little bit and, and share with you why we think this is really important uh, research from an SEI perspective. Because today we are focusing on Sweden, as you know, but we do think this is, is a really important uh, global issue and we need to understand the global context here. So I think for most of you tuning in today, we already know why sustainable consumption is a critical issue. But just to, to remind ourselves, first of all, I think science has really become more um, assertive on the need to really tackle sustainable consumption and production um, that, than previously. We have, of course, known about this issue for a long time. But if we look at, for example, uh, the synthesis of uh, big scientific assessments that UNEP uh, launched last year, uh, Making Peace with Nature. They looked at the IPCC reports, the IPES reports, the GEO reports, uh, other major scientific assessments. They really concluded very clearly that we need to more fundamentally, more systematically address uh, our consumption and production patterns. So uh, it appears that science is becoming more assertive on this topic. And of course, looking at the scale of the challenges we're facing, uh, uh, again, we need to really understand consumption drivers um, and the econ economic systems within which we operate. We need to decarbonize our economies by some 7%. And, and we know also about the, the huge uh, issues we're facing with biodiversity loss, pollution, chemicals, etc. So, um, we feel that it's really past the point where we can address uh, sort of marginal changes that individual consumers can make or individual producers can make, but really to look at the bigger systems for consumption and production. Taking a global perspective, it's uh, also very, uh, of course, important to really uh, integrate equity in this uh, discussion. And this is where the consumption perspective becomes so incredibly important and useful. For example, for Sweden, we know that when we look at how we perform on the SDGs, um, this country is typically ranked in the top three every year. Uh, if we look at, however, our spillovers and our interactions with the rest of the world, uh, the picture is very different. So our consumption footprints are much, much uh, larger than what is sustainable. Um, so uh, the challenges are big. Uh, but we also see some opportunities on the horizon and um, uh, to really sort of uh, start shifting, uh, bending the curves, shifting perspectives in order to achieve the SDG 12 and other important uh, sustainable consumption and production objectives. Um, one of these opportunities will happen in June next year in Stockholm, where Sweden and Kenya will host uh, the Stockholm Plus 50 International UN Meeting to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the first ever UN Conference on the Human Environment, which took place in 1972. Uh, in our discussions with the Swedish government from SEI, we have indeed highlighted the, the opportunity to really tackle sustainable consumption and production at this meeting and for Swedish, Sweden to, to really take a lead and show how we work with this issue. Um, we have also seen that it will likely be integrated in the leadership dialogues that are now being planned also by UNEP as the UN focal point uh, for the conference. Uh, SDI will provide a, an independent scientific report to inform this meeting together with an Indian partner, the Council for 
uh, environment, energy and water, and we will definitely mainstream the issue of consumption and lifestyles in our analysis. Um, so um, these were some big words, uh, big challenges. We need system change. Um, we need to uh, change the discourse and narratives around um, our economic systems. But for us, it's also very important that this is a science based discussion, uh, properly informed by data and, and uh, measures. So this is why PRINCE is a, such an important project um, to, to ensure that policy is indeed based on data and, and sort of uh, the best, best available science. Um, so with that, I would like to hand over now to, um, I believe we go directly to Anita Lundström. Yes, thank you. We are you. still waiting for Nils Brown to, to join us. Uh, so over to you, Anita Lundström, Senior Advisor at the Swedish Environmental Protection Agency. Thank you very much, Åsa. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, and it had been so nice to see you in real, but this works as well. Uh, so I just will give a short introduction to Prince and why we are doing this and why we had done this uh, earlier. Uh, so please, next slide. Uh, so why Prince? Uh, yes, the generational goal we have had uh, like 10, a little bit more than 10 years. And there are very beautiful words, a society in which the major, major environmental problems in Sweden have been solved without increasing environmental and health problems outside Sweden's border. Um, there are also other uh, environmental quality objectives and the Agenda 2030 that have been interesting in this and, and uh, motivating why Prince so we needed uh, prints to get a method to cal calculate and uh, quantify the environmental pressure uh, and caused by Swedish consumption abroad as well as nationally to help to help us to better understand the patterns uh, as well as the consequences of what we are doing. And uh, the generational goal is intended to guide uh, environmental action at every level of society. In, it indicates the sort of changes uh, in society that need to occur, occur uh, within one generation uh, to bring about a clean, healthy and a clean, healthy environment. And uh, the environmental quality objective describes the quality of the environment that Sweden strive to achieve. Uh, and to achieve this, uh, knowledge is needed. And uh, we need to have a better understanding, better knowledge to build a ground for policy development, which uh, is necessary to get a better base for decision making. And uh, when we have this base, then it's also more possible to implement uh, the environmental policy in collaboration with other uh, organizations and to, to reach uh, the objectives. So uh, what are the environmental pressures followed exerted by Swedish consumption abroad? Uh, so we have uh, a lot of different uh, way to, to use uh, uh, the result from prints as we can develop indicators, we can have a base for discussion on change it needed and uh, give a base for policy development, as I said before. Um, and this helps uh, also to point out uh, or indicate the sort of changes that we need. So uh, next slide, please. Um, we have a good example of how we have worked with a Swedish consumption based greenhouse gases. We had started with that already before uh, this project, but uh, it was not good enough to use as uh, um, really uh, statistics um, and we needed to work more on that. So that was that's why it was included in the PRINCE program. And uh, uh, here you can see, I just want to, want to show how, how it looks like. I, normally I also put in the, the consumption 
uh, uh, I mean the the territorial figures, uh, but here it's just the uh, the consumption uh, figures for Sweden, and we can see here that uh, in the first uh, up uh, left you could see uh, the difference between what we uh, produce from what we eating and drinking and uh, driving cars and all that, uh, and the difference between what what we produce inside Sweden and what we take from outside, or the, or the what we the pressure we put on others, and we also could divide them into groups for individuals. And as you see that uh, it looks like it's not going so much more than nearly just for uh, the right forward, but we have to think of that we have been nearly uh, increasing with one million people. So it's actually a decrease if you look at uh, per person, per capita. So that's, uh, and to follow this, it helps us to see that we don't just put over all the pressure to other countries when we are succeeding in uh, reducing it at home in Sweden. Uh, so this is important and I think now we should have the next slide please. So um, in Prince 2 we really uh, see for look forward to find more time series for chemicals, for instance. Uh, we had to where well, we wanted to know more about the cultivated fish, uh, how to farm fish, how how the the um, what what that gives uh, uh, for sort of pressure uh, on the environment. And we have not uh, succeeded to work enough with biodiversity, so we wanted more of that. And um, we want also to develop more new indicators for the generational goal. And also we want to have more possibilities to to uh, also uh, have policy discussion on how to do what to do uh, uh, so we could uh, have a better society and better future for the coming new generations. So uh, with this I want to uh, give over the floor to Elena Dawkins, uh, the research fellow at Stockholm Environmental Institute. Thank you. Thank you very much Anita and um... Yeah, uh, hello everyone. My name is Eleanor Dawkins. I'm a research fellow at SCI. Um, and I've been told that we've just been joined by the project lead for Prince, who uh, is joining by phone, Nils Brown. I think if he's uh, would like to jump in with a few words just to welcome everybody. Sure, can everybody hear me? Yep. Excellent. Um, well, uh, of course. Well, uh, thanks very much. I'm sorry I couldn't be connected. Um, uh, everybody, if we can uh, go to the slides, I think we have a great uh, agenda uh, today and I'm very pleased to uh, welcome everybody on behalf of the uh, project um, to to the to the webinar today. Um, so we will uh, momentarily, I'll pass back to uh, Eleanor, uh, one of our experts uh, in the Prince project. Um, he'll be presenting some of the findings from both Prince 1 and Prince 2 and then um, uh, we have Chris West and Martin Persson and myself will also be presenting some of the further findings. After that, on the hour, we're going to go back uh, to a panel discussion where we're very, very happy uh, to welcome uh, Jorge Lagonacelis, who is head of the Secretariat of the 10-year framework program for sustainable consumption of production at the United Nations Environment Program. Also joined by uh, Eva Olner, senior advisor at the Swedish Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, and Emma Nuriam, uh, who is chair of the Swedish Parliamentary Committee on the Environmental Goals. Um, and that uh, discussion will be chaired by uh, a key member of the Prince team, Jan Amsin Vedan, Professor of Environmental Strategic Analysis at KTH Royal Institute of Technology. Um, and after that, um, Orsa and I will deliver some closing remarks. So without further ado, and apologies for the delay, um, I'm very happy to hand back to uh, Eleanor. Thanks very much, everybody. It's very nice to see you all. OK, thanks very much, Nils. Right, so I'm going to uh, present to you a bit about what we did in the first PRINCE project, PRINCE 1, uh, the key findings and how some of the first PRINCE project findings have been used in policy. And this project ran from 2015 to 2019. 
and uh, was the first phase of PRINCE. And today then we'll go on to talk about the second phase, uh, the results of which you'll hear more about today. But uh, this second phase builds on the model and data development which we completed in the first phase. We could go to the next slide. <clears throat> Thanks. So the original aims of the PRINCE project were to estimate the environmental pressures exerted by Swedish consumption abroad and uh, develop an approach that could be used to accurately monitor and compare these pressures consistently over time. Go to the next slide. So to deliver on these aims, what do we do? So firstly, we investigated several different modelling options. The original aims project were to... So there's a little bit of feedback there. <laughs> OK, I'll keep going. Yep, we investigated several different modelling options and we selected and developed a, a new approach based on input-output analysis. And this approach coupled the Swedish statistical data with a multi-regional input-output model called Exiobase. And a key advantage of this approach was that you get good representation of the Swedish statistical data from Swedish national statistics combined with a good representation of um, <clears throat> the pressures associated with imports to Sweden via very complex global supply chains from the Exiobase database. So following that, we collected all of the necessary environmental data to make all of the indicators that we're interested in. So things like resource use, such as materials, land and water, emissions to air and hazardous chemical products. And then we developed the PRINCE model, uh, calculated the Swedish footprints, the environmental pressures associated with Swedish consumption. And we did this for a time series from 2008 to 2014 and analysed the results. And on top of this, we did several in-depth case studies, which uh, some of which we also build on in PRINCE2. Next slide, please. Yeah, so what can the PRINCE model tell us overall? It can give us this macro level overview of the changes in environmental pressures due to Swedish consumption over time. And no matter where in, those, where in the world those pressures occur, they're all, all allocated to the final goods consumed in Sweden. This means that we can also see the geographical hotspots of those environmental pressures and identify where in the world Swedish consumption drives environmental impacts and for which consumption items like food or textiles. So we had, if we go to the next slide, you can see the, the outputs that we had from PRINCE, so from the first phase of the PRINCE project. And in summary, we had some of the largest available footprint data set for Sweden to date, including all of these indicators for the time series that you can see here, and uh, one year for um, different types of chemical um, veterinary products. Um, and as I mentioned, we made several case studies, some of which you can see on the slide. And all of these results, uh, publications and reports can be found on our website, on our uh, new website, which um, you can see at the link in the bottom. So you can find all of the PRINCE1 results there, and then we will update that with the PRINCE2 findings as well when we, uh, as, as they come out. <clears throat> so if we go to the next slide. I'll give you a quick overview of some of the key findings we found in the first phase of the PRINCE project. So uh, we found uh, to start with that the majority, for the majority of environmental pressures, the impact of Swedish consumption is far higher than production, as uh, also mentioned at the beginning. And you can see here for a variety of indicators, I think land use is the only one that's the exception to that rule. Um, so yeah, that's very important to show the value of consumption-based accounting and understanding these impacts from consumption in the first place. And if we go to the next slide, you can see that the majority of uh, Swedish consumption-based pressures fall outside of Sweden, again, with the exception of land use, but here for a selection of a few indicators, you can see where those impacts are being felt, whether that's in Sweden, the rest of the EU or outside of the EU. And for some of these, uh, the difference is is very stark. So 90% of the impact of veterinary medicines, for example, is occurring outside of Sweden for Swedish consumption. So it's happening in other countries of the world to satisfy the consumption in Sweden. And we can even, if we look on the next slide, we can even see some of the uh, global hotspots of where the, indicate, where the uh, impacts are happening. So, for example, the rest of the EU, China and Russia stand out as some of the key global hotspots of pressures from Swedish consumption. 
And uh, I mean, this is, I'm trying to generalize across many indicators, but uh, this does vary depending on the indicators. And you can see in the graph there uh, for blue water use, for example, Spain features quite prominently as a hotspot of pressure associated with Swedish consumption. So it does vary between indicators, but in general, we can say something about where the pressures in, are occurring in the world and also for what types of products that Swedish um, that the uh, is consumed in the Swedish uh, economy. So for things like food products, construction and fossil fuels have uh, higher footprints for many of the environmental pressures. So lastly, on the uh, last slide, we go to the next one, we can see that over time, there has been a small reduction in many of the environmental pressures of Swedish consumption between 2008 and 2014, excluding material use, which went up. But despite this, uh, again, um, it's clear uh, that greater reductions are required if, we're avoid, uh, if we are to avoid major environmental problems such as global heating and damage to ecosystem, uh, ecosystems and biodiversity loss. We still need to reduce these footprints quite considerably. So lastly, I've got uh, the last two slides to tell you a little bit about how the PRINCE data and the uh, approach have been used in policy making so far. So firstly, taking Sweden, uh, we've been tracking a bit about how uh, uh, the data and model have been used by policymakers. And we found that in Sweden, policymakers have used this kind of footprint data to understand the scale of the challenge of sustainable consumption. Uh, explain these concepts and challenges to others, take more of a supply chain perspective in their work and recognise the importance of engaging actors along the whole supply chain. It's also been used to inform some legislation and particularly in highlighting the role of uh, procurement in sustainable consumption and production policy. Uh, the PRINCE data have also been used to support the ongoing inquiry into consumption-based greenhouse gas emissions target in Sweden, which you'll hear more about later. And uh, for this, the PRINCE team and Statistics Sweden in particular have been providing detailed data deliveries and also helping to assess the GHGs embodied in Sweden's exports. The PRINCE model was also uh, adopted by Statistics Sweden and is now used for producing the official st Swedish statistics on consumption-based greenhouse gas emissions, which have now been updated to the latest year 2019. And uh, the PRINCE results have also been used for monitoring the Swedish environmental quality objectives and sustainable development goals. It's also been used further in research for Mistra Sustainable Consumption Programme, for example. Uh, Statistics Sweden is working further on the development of multi-regional environmental input output model for Sweden. And uh, myself and colleagues at SEI are working on breaking down the national level greenhouse gas emissions footprint data to municipal and postcode level in Sweden. So lastly, I'll just uh, give you an idea of how some of the PRINCE data and approach have been used in policy more globally as well. Uh, some of the PRINCE findings have been used to support the development of the proposed EU legislation on deforestation that's coming out um, under consultation currently. Also to understand the impacts of UK consumption on biodiversity loss and deforestation um, by several NGOs for monitoring deforestation as well, informing the EU debate on carbon border adjustments and also by the Danish Energy Agency for a uh, consumption based greenhouse gas emissions indicator. And all of this and more will be explained in our final report, which will come out in March, which I think Nils will tell you a bit more about at the end of the webinar. So now I'll hand over to my colleagues on the PRINCE project who will tell you about how we're building on this uh, PRINCE, the first PRINCE project, developing um, PRINCE 1 and the new indicators that we're looking at in PRINCE 2. So I'll hand over now to Chris West from SCI York who will tell you about their team's work on biodiversity and fisheries in PRINCE 2. Thank you. Thank you, Ali. Um, Please. Um, I'm not sure it has. My my start. Oh, there we are. Okay. So thanks, everybody. My, my name is Chris West, and I'm a senior researcher at the York Centre of CI in the UK. And I'll just be covering two gap analyses that we've been doing for the Prince Two project, which have aimed to explore how current in the coverage of Sweden's consumption-based accounting might be filled. 
So first I'll be talking about the potential inclusion of biodiversity metrics, which wasn't something we looked at at all in the first Prince project. Uh, next slide, please. Increasingly, global biodiversity loss is being recognised now alongside climate change as one of the world's biggest uh, challenges. And during COP26, we saw international recognition of the role that international markets are playing in driving deforestation and biodiversity loss. And additionally, next year's Convention on Biological Diversity meeting will be vital for setting action on the 2020 agenda. Um, however, the issue of developing mechanisms and is to monitor and report on overseas biodiversity losses addressed. And one reason for this is that biodiversity is quite complex. There's no simple, simple metric which accounts for the various aspects of biodiversity that we might wish to monitor. And whilst things like land area or deforestation and land use change can provide good proxies for the pressures placed on biodiversity, they don't necessarily fully align with all of the pressures that we might be experiencing globally on species. Next slide. Um, now, the complexity in measures that have been developed to account for biodiversity in supply chain or, bi or consumption linked impact assessments can be uh, quite overwhelming. Um, but many can actually just be down to a few broad categories. Uh, so, for example, shown here, and they're not fully comprehensive. And indeed, there's going to be lack between these categories, but they serve to cover some of the most approaches. Now, one approach that can be adopted is the explicit assessment of threats to species that, are, that can then be linked to biodiversity loss. And this might, for example, be the utilisation of biodiversity threat categories, uh, which are then linked to sectors in the multi regional output model. Um, and these uh, sectors then act as drivers for these threats. Uh, you skipped ahead of slide there, Ian. Um, the authors have explored relationships whereby model changes in biodiversity can be linked to the extent or quality of habitats, which can then turn can in turn then be linked to production processes. And finally, one can simply assess the potential risks to species by ways of production, observed or modeled information on species abundance or species rain. Now, overall, Alexander Marquez and has highlighted the multiple metrics be needed for biodiversity, but they make the case that these measures should be adopted in impact assessments and, and should really represent at least two aspects. First, a measure of the species extinction risk and also the ecosystem function affected potentially by production and consumption. And um, when deciding which consumption based accounts we must consider a variety of things. Firstly, what's being measured. So we can't usually measure biodiversity directly itself. So our measures and metrics have to be based on subsets of data and properties. And these may tell us about potential pressures placed on biodiversity or may attempt to quantify the impacts uh, more accurately. Uh, we must also understand what is actually driving biodiversity impact in the metrics. Most biodiversity metrics are land use change, but others are in use too, such as the potential impacts associated with pollution, although these are typically less well developed internationally. We must also consider how easy it is to apply and communicate the measures, how easily is the data accessed, is there enough documentation around it, are they globally available, and how easy is it for the layperson to understand what's being monitored. And finally, we need to understand whether the metrics are responsive to real world changes on the ground. We need to understand how and whether the metric will actually respond to positive interventions in landscapes, for example, or to the further degradation of environmental conditions. Uh, next slide, please, Ian. So hopefully this is uh, my on my side, it's a bit laggy, but hopefully you can now see um, a table. And I thought it'd be very quick, useful just to quickly illustrate the application of biodiversity metrics within consumption based accounting. Uh, this example was actually conducted within the work for the UK government that Ellie mentioned earlier, uh, but the results for Sweden are shown in this table. And we integrated two simple biodiversity measures linked to agricultural production systems. The first was based on a uh, species area relationship, which quantifies the potential species associated with agricultural production. And another metric used a geospatially defined crop extent uh, to scale the hectares of agricultural land use by the species richness in those areas. And we can see that although approximately half of the mass of agricultural production linked to Swedish consumption is produced domestically, i.e. within Sweden, the land required and the associated risks to biodiversity are disproportionately felt outside of Sweden. Next slide, please. 
And so far, a further breakdown of this data, we can also observe that whilst the bulk of land required for Swedish consumption is actually distributed across the northern hemisphere, the biodiversity metrics tend to put greater weight on production in the tropics. So there's these differences in the in the spatial extent and the spatial impact areas, the hotspots that can be observed by the integration of the biodiversity information. Next slide, please. So overall, um, biodiversity risks and impacts already can be linked to consumption-based accounting. There are examples of this having been done. And with this in mind, we recommend that it's possible to move ahead with incorporating simple but fit-for-purpose metrics of biodiversity into Sweden's accounts. Given, however, that the research landscape that surrounds this area continues to advance rapidly, we feel that the uh, research should be kept under review over time. And we also recognise the need to improve upon areas of biodiversity impacts that are not so well researched, for example, links between pollution and species loss uh, and the impacts of non-terrestrial environments, for example. Finally, support should be provided particularly for the maintenance of data sets and tools to keep them current and responsive over time. So I'm now just going to move then to the fisheries gap analysis that we've been conducting. I hope the slides are keeping up because I can't see them on my screen, but um, hopefully it will work for everybody else. Um, I'm so I'm now going to give an overview, as I said, of, of some of the work we've been doing on fisheries production, um, and this builds upon an advances uh, initial work that was done in the Prince in the first Prince project. Uh, next slide, please, Ian. And fisheries production has received somewhat limited attention to date in consumption-based accounting, and this is really one of the key reasons why we're working on this area in Prince Two. But we're also looking at fisheries because they ultimately are an important contribution to global nutritional security and are also important for global economies. Sustainable fisheries also form a key component of the state sustainable development goals, um, but they've historically been quite poorly managed. Car capture fisheries, for example, have been associated with overfishing and environmental damage and aquaculture production, which has risen dramatically in the past 20 to 30 years. Uh, and is now as a result comparable to the mass produced in, in capture fisheries is associated with other environmental concerns. And the impacts associated with fisheries vary widely. Um, so they vary by the production location, the species caught or harvested, the technologies used and so on. And therefore obtaining more granular information on the linkages between consumption and those fisheries production systems can help to unpick which impacts or risks um, Swedish consumption might be linked to. Next slide. So here are a few of the key impacts that are associated with fisheries that we've been exploring in this gap analysis. And on the left is a sort of classic concern associated with capture fisheries, potential damage to habitats that certain fishing gears cause. And in this case, it's uh, the damage from bottom trawling, which is, uh, has quite stark habitat uh, effects. On the top right is another key concern linked to capture fisheries the bycatch or discards associated with non-selective gear types where species are effectively thrown away because they have no economic value or because they exceed quota limits. And on the bottom right, we have a key concern associated with aquaculture production, um, algal blooms and eutrophication, which are linked to nutrient loading from unutilised feed. Next slide. So within PRINCE2, we've undertaken the construction of a new preliminary environmental extension for the consumption-based account for fisheries. And we're using a couple of data sets here. So FAO uh, data in the form of something called FishStatJ is the core data set for this account. And it provides a baseline time series of global capture and aquaculture production by country of production, uh, compiled then from official reported records, which is submitted to the UN FAO. Now, for marine fisheries, we're also using information from a project called Sea Around Us, which is a project based at the University of British Columbia in Canada. And this data set provides estimates of the gear types utilised for those captures and the discards associated with those gears. We can combine those two data sets to disaggregate the capture estimates into the gear types used and also the discards that those gear types are associated with. And then we can do this across the full time series of data that we have for individual countries of production, for individual species or species groups targeted by those countries. And these data then comprise an environmental extension to the XGO base multi-regional impact output model, which then provides us with a consumption-based account. Next slide. <clears throat> So for marine captures, um, these new data allow us to understand the contribution of gear types to the Swedish fisheries footprint and also the associated discard rates. 
So here we show the total marine captures linked to Swedish consumption. The most obvious take home here really is that marine capture fisheries have become overall less important to Swedish consumers over time. But we can also see that pelagic or midwater trawling, which is shown in the blue area at the bottom of the chart there, seems to have decreased substantially in importance as a fishing method. We can also break this sort of data down into the individual species or species group targeted, although I haven't got time actually to show this uh, this morning. You also note here that there is a grey hatched area at the top of the chart, and this is an unallocated portion of the catch where we couldn't make an initial match between the two data sets, FishStatJ and the Sea Around Us records, uh, because of mismatches that exist in the classif classification schemes used. And the next step for ongoing work would be to improve our allocation methods to allow better matching between those data sets. Next slide. So uh, just quickly then for aquaculture at this stage, we have simply implemented an extension based on the FAO FishStat data that provides the breakdown of sources and species linked to consumption activities. And for the total Swedish footprint, we can see that the contribution of aquaculture to Swedish consumption has increased and that this is dominated by the production of Atlantic salmon, again shown in the blue at the bottom of the chart there. Now, we know from a review of the literature that eutrophication effects are likely to be one of the key concerns when it comes to the aquacultural fisheries, but we couldn't identify a global data set that covered these impacts in enough detail to fully integrate into a consumption uh, account at this stage. So this will also be a target for future work. So that's all from me. Uh, I'm now going to hand to Martin, uh, who would be taking you through the next gap analysis. Thank you, Chris. Uh, so I will talking, we'll talk a bit about what we've done in terms of, of land use change, primarily tropical deforestation. Uh, and as Chris already, already indicated, deforestation is one of the key drivers of terrestrial biodiversity loss. Uh, it's also the accounts for about the tenth of global carbon emissions and, and uh, impacts uh, livelihoods for hundreds of millions of peoples across the tropics. Um, and this deforestation we know is, has been increasingly driven by, by trade in the last couple of decades and of, of forest risk commodities like soybeans, beef, palm oil and so on. And you can go to the next slide. Uh, Ian. Um, so one thing we did prior to the first print project, there wasn't a comprehensive data set on the extent to which deforestation was driven by agricultural commodity production, trade and consumption. Uh, so this was a big part of, of what we did in, in Prince One, developing a model to, uh, to quantify these, uh, these links. So what you see here on the left hand side is an update from that model. Uh, showing the amount of deforestation that is attributed to different commodities across the major tropical regions, Americas, Asia and Africa. Uh, so you can see that we attribute about 4 million hectares per year uh, to, to production of ag agriculture commodities. Um, most of it in, in, in Latin America, uh, where beef is the main driver, followed by soybeans. Uh, whereas in Asia, for example, you see that palm oil is the biggest driver uh, of, of deforestation. Uh, on the right hand side, you see the extent to which these commodities are uh, traded. So about a quarter of the total of deforestation we, we attribute to agriculture commodities is internationally traded. So most of the consumption driving this deforestation is still found in the, in the production countries. But it also differs a lot, as you see, between regions and between commodities. So some commodities like palm oil and, and soybeans are primarily traded while others like beef cattle are uh, primarily consumed domestically. Um, if, you in, if you also include for all final demand in, 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 in the whole world with, uh, with this extra base model, uh, the amount of deforestation that is driven by, by sort of external demand or international demand is, is raises to about 40%. Uh, so when you get all the in, indirect links and so on. Next slide, please. So what you see here are some key results from this follow up project in terms of uh, deforestation carbon emissions due to Swedish consumptions uh, time series from 2005 to 2018. Uh, so you see that uh, for the last year of our analysis in 2018, uh, Swedish consumption uh, led to carbon emissions of about 3 million tons uh, due to tropical deforestation. Uh, so that, just to give a comparison, that's uh, in the same magnitude as our uh, methane emissions from domestic uh, agriculture. So it's a significant uh, emission source uh, from a Swedish perspective. 
Uh, you see it's divided here by food consumption uh, and non-food consumption. So if we just look at the food consumption, it's about 2 million uh, tons of carbon dioxide per year, uh, translating to about a tenth of the, the carbon footprint of an average EU, uh, Swedish diet that is due to deforestation. Uh, also here you see a decreasing trend, uh, especially for, for the food consumption uh, part, um, but it's sort of contrasting. On the one hand, uh, you see decreases for, for most commodities, partly due to reduction in deforestation in production um, countries, also to changes in, in, in Swedish consumption. Uh, on the other hand, for the two main commodities uh, that cause deforestation linked to Swedish consumption, uh, palm oil production in Indonesia and beef production in Brazil, you actually see an increasing trend in the last uh, 10 years or so. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Um, so what about the potential for actually uh, including this, uh, this data in, in official statistics for Sweden, for example? Uh, so clearly, I would say the 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 uh, this data meets one of these criteria for for uh, inclusion in a statistic, which is relevance. Uh, there is an increasing um, policy focus on demand side environmental policy, as I've, I've already been mentioned, and I think we'll come back to that. Uh, and and this data has already been used, for example, in in the. Uh, legislative proposal from the EU Commission that came last week on addressing deforestation, where our data was used uh, in, in the impact assessment underlying that proposal. Um, next slide. On accuracy, uh, one thing, a key limitation to, to keep in mind here is that the lack of spatially explicit data on both production and trade in place that uh, implies that this indicator should be interpreted as a measure of deforestation risk. Uh, um, but that is no different, I would say, from other consumption-based indicators where we seldom have sort of production-specific uh, data on, on, on emissions or and trade and so on. Uh, we've cross-checked the results uh, against more detailed studies for, for key commodities like soybeans, palm oil and so on, uh, and uh, there's a robust underlying methodology here that's been peer-reviewed. So overall, I think uh, the results can be uh, viewed as uh, fulfilling the, the accuracy criteria as well. Thank you very much. I'll hand over now to Nils that will talk to the on the chemicals gap analysis. Hello. Um, yes, very nice to be here again. Um, so yes, I will present uh, the results of the work we've done on chemicals. We'll go to the next slide to introduce the topic. So. The main starting point to explain the significance of chemicals is that every day in society we use 100,000 chemical, 100,000 different kinds of chemicals. These chemicals are included in very complex supply chains, of course, uh, and it's known um, that uh, these chemicals when released to the environment can have adverse effects on the environment and uh, on human health. And of course, pol policymakers, uh, if you look at the policy landscape, they're very well aware of this, so I've taken up um, a few key areas um, on different levels. Um, so internationally, we have the Agenda 2030 goals that specifically lift questions of chemicals. Uh, in the EU, uh, I can sum up with the Chemical Strategy for Sustainability, uh, the Directive on the Sustainable Use of Pesticides, to give examples. And of course, in Sweden, um, there's a focus according to the Environmental Quality Objective, uh, non-toxic environment. Uh, so in light of that, um, we go to the next slide. Um, in the PRINCE project, starting in the first PRINCE project um, a few years ago, uh, work was focused on trying to find macro, macro, macroscopic indicators uh, that could really express um, to policy um, how progress is going um, with respect to these chemicals. And um, on the basis of that first project, um, three areas specifically uh, were identified uh, as being valuable areas for the production uh, of time series. And those are the areas that we've worked further on in uh, the PRINCE continuation project this year. Um, you see those on the slide. There's uh, use of pesticides, uh, use of hazardous chemical products, and use of ag agricultural antibiotics. Um, and we've used uh, sources of data which are freely available on the internet and which are uh, produced and updated uh, by a statistical office or equivalent uh, in order to be able to produce these. 
Uh, and those have allowed us to produce uh, time series in each of these areas for the data. And the first of those time series is on the next slide. So this slide shows Sweden's consumption based use of agricultural antibiotics. So it includes um, the agricultural antibiotics used in Swedish production uh, and consumed in Sweden and also agricultural antibiotics used outside of Sweden uh, for products that are imported into Sweden. So I've written the take home at the top. Um, you can see that there's uh, a fairly strong decrease of about 50% between the start of the time series 2008 and 2019. Um, and that's uh, certainly done um, in the context of active uh, EU actions to reduce the amount of agricultural antibiotics in use. Uh, you can also see if you look at the, it's the dark green bar, which is third from the bottom, that is the agricultural use in Swedish production. Um, that contributes to Swedish consumption. So another take home here is the fact that um, it's actually imported uh, agricultural products that answer for most of the consumption based agricultural antibiotic use uh, in Sweden. We go to the next slide. Uh, I'll show you the uh, time series that we produced for, for pesticide use. Um, here for pesticide use, um, according to the time series, there are some variation. But by and large, we really don't see any decrease between the start and the finish. Um, if, if anything, there's a slight uh, trend towards a decrease, um, but not very much. Again, you can see Sweden in this figure is represented by the blue bar at the bottom. It is the largest single contributor to the consumption based uh, pesticide use in Sweden. At the same time, it's imported production that contributes uh, the majority. Uh, and in the next slide, I can show you the results. Uh, that we have for hazardous chemical products. And here you can see it's a little more variable uh, time series, but you can see between the start and the finish, you can see a significant increase in the use of hazardous chemical products. Here, Sweden is also the largest single um, producer country to con contribute to the consumption based footprint. At the same time, it is imported products by and large that dominate in the footprint as a whole. So I can go to the summary slide that I have now. So the main achievement of the work we've done in chemicals in PRINCE2 is that we've taken the work from PRINCE1, which did calculations for a single year and that Ellie showed, and we, uh, we showed not only methodolo methodologically, it was possible uh, to produce time series, which are informative from a policy perspective. And also thanks to that, we could demonstrate these clear macroscopic trends that I've summarized for you here now. Um, Amongst those macroscopic trends, it's important to uh, emphasize that consistently we see in the time series for these products um, that you see that it's imported products uh, that dominate uh, even in Sweden uh, and from, from a consumption perspective. Um, and with that, I'm happy to uh, round out the uh, round out the conclusions on the on the uh, chemical side of the work that we've done in Prince 2. I'd like to uh, remind everybody that's attending that you have the possibility of asking questions uh, to, to us experts right now. And to do so, you would go into the uh, Q&A chat. Uh, and, th and then having done that, uh, one of us uh, that is presenting will be able to pick up that question and we will aim to answer the questions uh, just after I've finished uh, the presentation on official statistics that I'm going into next. Um, so we'll go to the next slide and change tack slightly. So one of the other purposes and aims of the work we've done in PRINCE2 is to, to investigate the possibility to use the gap analyses that we've done to be able to go in and produce official statistics. So in the next slide, I address what the criteria are for official statistics. Now I emphasize that it's a multi-dimensional uh, quality assessment that we do. And in each of these bubbles, I show one of the five legally required dimensions of quality that we work from. Now, I will start by saying something about um, criteria for timeliness, timeliness and punctuality. You need to produce statistics. Um, a statistic is of high quality when it comes out um, a short period of time after the last reference, pe reference period uh, for the statistic uh, that you're producing. So as soon as possible, if you're producing a yearly statistic, produce it as soon as possible after the final year of the data that you're producing. Uh, accessibility and clarity, this is something which we answer for it Statistics Sweden as an official produ producer of official statistics. Um, we have the website we present in the database, we present in a number of formats, etc. So that's something that is covered by Statistics Sweden as a base. Um, in terms of coherence and comparability up in the left hand corner, 
uh, one of the key criteria there is that we're producing data that is uh, that can, for example, be compared with other countries, and also that we're producing time series uh, where we're aware of any potential differences that may occur in the reporting throughout the time series, so that we can convey those to users. Now, specific. Um, the areas that we've looked at in particular when we've looked at official statistics uh, in the project is specifically for the relevance of the statistic and the accuracy. Now relevance talks to the fact that there is a need amongst users for the data that we're producing. Um, so in this particular context when we're talking about guiding uh, policies that we mentioned earlier today, so showing that there are policies for which the data that we're producing and statistics um, can follow up on. Uh, and in terms of accuracy, uh, the question is really simply how close the data may be uh, to a potential true value uh, for what you're trying to express. And in the next slide, I show largely how we've assessed uh, these specific dimensions of relevance and of accuracy. And as you can see with the green ticks, uh, we ultimately judge that in each of these areas, we have shown that there is a potential uh, to produce data. Of course, as I as I have said, and, and as the um, previous experts presenting on land use change, uh, fisheries and biodiversity, we have gone into the data uh, in depth and in detail, and we know it very well. Uh, and we also, so we can give give a picture of where the data is. Uh, we do understand where the data is coming from, and on the basis of that, we can affirm that the accuracy is, as Chris said earlier, fit for purpose. Uh, to answer uh, the, the relevance and the need of policymakers. Um, we go to the next slide um, where I talk more about uh, the degree of maturity in terms of the production. Now we at Statistics Sweden, uh, I mentioned earlier that Statistics Sweden we were working with the chemical side of things, we looked at pesticides, agriculture and antibiotics and hazardous chemical products uh, and on that basis of course in the column for institutional mandate for, in for, for inputs I'm talking about the fact that we're getting data uh, from, for example, uh, the Food and Agricultural Organization. Uh, we're getting data from us internally uh, and we're getting data from uh, the European Med Medical Agency. And we know those data are being updated regularly. Um, uh, we also have the process in place, thanks to the work we've done in the uh, gap analysis here in, in print, uh, to be able to move through. But that's why you see green ticks um, for pesticides, agriculture, antibiotics and hazardous chemical products. Uh, on the side of biodiversity, fisheries and land use change, we are certain that we have high quality data. Um, at the same time, uh, we're not giving uh, it the same uh, green ticks, rather on the uh, green, uh, red and orange scale. Um, we think that um, there's a slightly different status uh, for those data. And of course, it has been our experts at uh, uh, Charles Institute Technology and SMR producing the data so far. So we don't have the prices in place at Statistics Sweden to be able to work with. OK, and I, I have one more slide. So to sum up the work we've done on chemicals, we've shown that uh, the indicators we've developed are fit for purpose. That is to say they answer a policy need and they are accurate to do so. Uh, in terms of the practical, practical application, we've been looking at the institutional mandate for the input data. We've been looking at the processes that we have already in place at Statistics Sweden. Uh, and finally, this final point, which is something that I haven't mentioned, maybe because it's something which uh, suffuses all of the work uh, that we do at Statistics Sweden. Um, it's key that uh, in our statistics production, we have the resources uh, to dedicate the expert time that is required uh, to be able to produce the time series according to the quality dimensions uh, that I've mentioned. Uh, on which point, um, we have a few minutes before we go through to uh, the panel discussion uh, to address some questions. Um, and I have um, a few questions here. Um, firstly, I have a question from Lynn, and I believe that question is about biodiversity. So if Chris, uh, you have the opportunity to answer. Uh, Lynn is wondering in what way we want you want to work more with biodiversity? Um, thank you. I'm not sure if you can hear me or not because my internet is very uh, bad at the moment. But um, 
Uh, this might be a, uh, a question that's also directed for the for Annika, I guess, but um, I think the, the fundamental reason for looking at biodiversity in addition to some of the other metrics that are used uh, in consumption based accounting is the fact that um, we know that biodiversity is very spatially heterogeneous so it's it, the, the distribution of biodiversity is is very different in different parts of the world and the impacts on biodiversity are very different in different parts of the world and those aren't usually accounted for fully adequately with some of the other measures so it's really an understanding of, of how these things are are um, impacting more specifically on biodiversity as opposed to say forest loss and um, that we really want to grapple with I think going forward I'm not sure if you heard that sorry so it sounded great to me thanks very much Chris um, I have another question I have a question which maybe uh, is something to do with uh, statistics in Sweden work so the question is how does statistics Sweden deal with the fact that XI base has so far been solely EU project based i.e the future updates are unknown uh, if the consumption footprint is now part of the official statistics, how will it be continued into the future? Uh, yes, indeed, um, XI base has is a product of research. Um, we have very good uh, relations and contact with um, with the producers of XI base. Uh, someone who uh, is not presenting right now, but has been actively uh, part of the ongoing Prince project is uh, Richard Wood, uh, formerly a professor at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology and one of the key figures in the production of uh, the XI based data. Uh, we have very good contact with them and for the past five years or so anybody that goes in uh, to the publicly available data uh, on Zenodo uh, on XI base will be aware that that is that has been updated regularly uh, and it does and they do supply documentation and they are always available uh, to provide comment on the methods they use. The methods are comprehensively um, documented. Um, and to which extent uh, we have made the judgment from Statistics Sweden in light of the very high relevance uh, of the statistics that XI base is a valuable source of produce official statistics. We have certainly noticed in the process of the work that we've done that uh, we need to we need to include XI base in a slightly different way uh, to the way that we include the source data that comes internally at Statistics Sweden. That is to say, uh, data that comes from the national accounts about uh, production in the economy and the exchanges that go on between the different industries and final demand. So uh, we are, uh, we, we do have processes in place there um, to address uh, the specific differences that arise when using a source like XI base compared to a source like uh, those that we get in time. Um, just checking the time. Um, I had a very one question from an anonymous um, uh, from an anonymous attendee uh, is is international aviation and maritime transport included in the results that are presented? Um, I'm not quite sure about the context of that question, but to say broadly about the Prince model, I would suggest, I would say, uh, I will say that yes, um, maritime transport that arises as part of the supply chain for Swedish consumption and aviation uh, that arises um, as part of the supply chain in Swedish consumption are included in consumption based data that we're producing. On which note, we're almost at the hour. Um, and I would take the opportunity to hand over to um, the Professor of Environmental Strategic Analysis at uh, KTH uh, and Chair for the panel discussion, uh, Joran Finbier. Welcome to the virtual floor, Joran, and thank you very much to our um, expert presenters. Thank you. Great presentations and I'm very much looking forward to this panel discussion where we have uh, Jorge Laguna Celes, head of the 10 year framework program secretariat at the United Nations Environment. Eva Olne, senior advisor at the Swedish Environmental Protection Agency and Emma Norian, chair of the Swedish Parliamentary Committee on the Environmental Goals. And um, I'll ask some some questions to the panel members, but there are also some some change chances to continue asking the questions in the Q&A. Um, 
I would like to start asking Jorge Laguna Celes. Um, can you tell a little bit about the framework program and how indicators like the ones we are discussing here today fit into that work? Thank you very much, Goran. And uh, at the outset, let me send uh, to all of you warm greetings from uh, Paris uh, and, uh, and, and this expression that we would like very much to be there uh, with you all physically together. Um, of course, uh, I will present what the One Planet Network is and what the One Planet Network does and how can One Planet Network support the work that you are doing. But before I do so, let me just say uh, two very brief messages. One, it is extremely relevant that we are having this conversation led by Sweden, especially in this very important milestone year that we are preparing for the Stockholm Plus 50 conference. It is absolutely critical that we take all available opportunities to heighten the political visibility of sustainable consumption and production. Tools like the ones that we are discussing today, such as sprints and others that I will be sharing with you in the course of this panel are extremely important to make sure that we help all countries. We leave no one behind in ensuring that we can move from a not being able to track our actual environmental footprint in the spirit of solidarity. And this is what is so important about Prince, is it that the spirit of solidarity, the spirit of common stewardship of this planet, it is absolutely embedded. And we would like to make that known in Stockholm Plus 50, but to bring the relevant players. Let's have a discussion on how we can do that by creating an open space where these and other tools can be uh, addressed, presented and highlighted so we stand ready to support that goal what the one planet network is it is very simple we are the only universally adopted agreement that addresses sustainable consumption and production we are as a matter of fact a framework that is designed to facilitate implementation of an integrated and coordinated approach to sustainability which balances the social the economic the environmental we are the glue that is increasingly connected, connecting the climate agendas, the biodiversity agendas and the pollution agendas by promoting a systems approach within the United Nations system. And we are helping UNEP, our host uh, and the institution that provides the secretariat, mainstream international action to address the triple planetary crisis on pollution, loss of biodiversity and also climate change. We are a network that is comprised not only of 193 member states and their official representatives, more than 140 national focal points, over 5,000 institutions and individuals that are supporting a global movement towards sustainable consumption and production. And we also host and provide support to six incredibly important programs that are supporting from a very concrete perspective the agenda of SCP. And these are, if you don't know them, let me start with sustainable lifestyles for those that are, are attendees that perhaps don't know. This is co-led by the Stockholm Environment Institute, and it is one of these programs which is helping us advance the SCP agenda. The other programs are about sustainable construction uh, and, and buildings. The um, consumer information, which I will have the opportunity to talk a little bit more today. Uh, we also talk about uh, lifestyles and we have a program on lifestyles, a program on tourism as well, and a very important program on food systems. And a lot of the findings that I heard today will be very key and we can take it to our program on sustainable food systems. So in a nutshell, that is what we are, a global movement that supports action at the highest political level, but also connected with countries to move towards sustainable consumption and production by promoting sustainable economic policies. Thank you very much. Very interesting to, to hear. Let me now turn to Eva Alner, um, Senior Advisor at the Swedish Environmental Protection Agency. Um, you have been working with the sustainable consumption for, for quite some time now at the Swedish EPA. How would you describe the 
development so far and, and where are we now, so to speak? Mm, thank you, Göran, and also nice to meet you all this beautiful morning in Stockholm and this very historical day with a new Swedish female um, prime minister. Um, thank you, Hodge, for the introduction of the One Planet Network. And I'm uh, the Swedish APA is the national focal point for One Planet Network in Sweden. And we are also very eager to continue to work with the PRINCE program to use all the results and findings uh, that you have shown. And I recall when I listened to you that uh, almost 10 years ago when we made a pre-study for the PRINCE program, we expected that the biodiversity indicator would take the longest time to develop. I don't know if that's true, but I was very encouraged with all the interesting results you showed related to biodiversity loss today. Um, yes, I would like to take you 10 years back in time. And that was the first time when the Swedish EPA declared officially that the sustain and already high and increasing um, consumption volumes is the major obstacle for reaching the environmental objectives and the, especially the generation goal, which as you know, in, uh, says that we should solve all the environmental problems within Sweden uh, without increasing negative impact outside the Swedish borders. So that was very, uh, I think that was a milestone for the at that time, the, the conclusion was underpinned by a pilot study made by the Sweden Statistics Sweden in close collaboration with KTH and other researchers and also the Swedish GPA. And um, that was um, um, the first step, I would say, for us to try to track the consumption based emission, greenhouse gas emissions uh, over time. And after that, I think the, the government was um, responding with a, government, a governmental assignment asking the Swedish EPA to develop a um, policy instrument to reduce the environmental impact from Swedish consumption, uh, which we did. And also in 2015, the uh, sustainable consumption patterns was uh, appointing, uh, appointed a focus area in the in-depth evaluation of the Swedish environmental goal. And that was the first time we discussed uh, the need for a national consumption goal, so to say. And another milestone. Um, and then, of course, the PRINCE program was kicked up, kicked off in 2015. And uh, the first time we used uh, um, the PRINCE results officially in, at the Swedish EPA was in 2019 when the greenhouse, official then greenhouse gas indicator was used in the in evaluation of the climate goal. So that was a little about, bit about the history. So where are we now? As you know, um, the government is now investigating the introduction of uh, um, national consumption goals. We will hear more about that in, uh, in short. And uh, in 2023, the Swedish Environmental Agency will present the second in-depth evaluation of the generation goal. Um, it has only been done once before, and that was in, in 2012, 10 years ago. So our ambition in that work is to use the results from the PRINCE program, all the findings and indicators as far as possible to be able to uh, uh, tell something about how is Sweden doing uh, now in, uh, in this, with this regard. So uh, finally, I would like to say that I think we are only in the very, very beginning of uh, addressing uh, this huge challenge we face related to consumption and production, both in Sweden and globally. Thank you very much, Eva. It's interesting to hear this um, historic perspective <laughs> and it takes time to drive these agendas um, that you have been, been pushing now for, for quite some time. Uh, I would like now I'd like to turn to Emma Norian, Chair of the Swedish Parliamentary Committee on the Environmental Goals. You have been 
given the task to develop a strategy for for uh, consumption environment uh, for minimizing environmental impacts from consumption how is the work going and uh, what will you deliver yes what will we deliver that's uh, still on in a discussion but uh, as you said i'm i'm the chair of this um, committee and it's uh, a cross party committee and uh, so all all parties in the swedish parliament are represented and we have the task from the from the government to come up with consumption based a strategy for consumption based to lower the consumption based emissions or environmental inputs and we will uh, prepare for or suggest goals for the consum consumption based emissions and also for aviation shipping and public procurement and we got this assignment a year ago and we will uh, be uh, hand it over to the government in February in the end of February so uh, it's a huge task and many different parts uh, in this and the reason why you put it in this cross-party board is to make sure that you talk outside the everyday politics uh, you can say and have a chance to have a learning process together over the parties and also try to make sure that you come up with the best solution and the one that is as many as possible can agree upon and hopefully all Swedish parties can agree upon the things that we are uh, we will hand over to the government but it's it's uh, tricky and we need uh, all this data input that we have heard about today and even more and it's also always a question of do we have enough data to to make action or do we need something more and okay now we know this for for this section but what does it mean for employment or for jobs and and for the economy and so on so it's we wave in uh, waited all the different policy areas with our work so it's it's a large work but it's also very fun and and as eva said here it's i think more will come this is the first early steps uh, it's still uh, what i know we are the first one in the world doing this so we have no one to look into we can we can take small parts from different countries and and learn but i don't think anyone has taken this big scope on this one Thank you. Um, we're really looking forward to, to that report in, in February. Um, but what you, you mentioned that uh, do we need something more? Are there other indicators than the ones we have discussed here that would be of relevance for, for your work? I mean, everything is always welcome then when you got one model you say that okay but we we what happens if we squeeze on this part or what happens if we include this so i think when you have statistics and models you're never ready but you <laughs> have to make sure that you also can put them together uh, and also make sure that it's overlooking other uh, policy uh, areas as i said we when you now we talk about the emission, about the carbon footprint, and we can just stop with things. That's that's the easiest way. But what happened with the society? And that's when policy making is, is taking part. How do we make this transition just? And as uh, our friend here from UN said, leave no one behind. It's not only between countries, it's also within a country. And that's uh, what we have to make sure that we will have a, 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 a nice society in, in the forefront here and that will make this a good and just uh, transition to uh, 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 less carbon emissions. Thank you very much. Um, a follow up question to, to Jorge. Um, do you know of other countries where there are similar policy discussions like like the ones you just heard of, uh, that is ongoing in Sweden? Are there other countries that have consumption based goals or are discussing consumption based goals? Absolutely. Uh, each and every country with its own development path uh, is uh, working uh, one way or the other to ensure 
that consumption is looked at from uh, certain angles. There are four areas here that I would like to, to share that are common to the global debate that we are seeing and in which this experience can be extremely helpful. I think that first and foremost, we have the issue of absorption. There is no lack of sophisticated tools uh, out in the market that are being developed by think tanks that are being developed by research institutions. What we are seeing as we are working with 193 countries and especially those that have already a sustainable consumption and production strategy, it is the lack of capacities to absorb those tools. So we are working with countries as diverse as uh, Grenada, Barbados, Senegal, Mauritius in helping them first and foremost have an institutional framework, but also have the ability to use some of the tools that are out there. And that is why it's important to have baselines and common tools and methodologies. One good example on this, and this is my second point, it's about data and comparability of data. It is the hotspot analysis tool, the SCP HAT tool. This SCP HAT tool tracks and analyzes information on environmental footprints for over 164 countries, including Sweden. And although the data is not always up to date because some countries have a more granular way of measuring, the trend does not lie and it does shows the global picture that countries need to do more. So the second it is yes, countries need to invest in data and in tools to monitor and to measure their progress and their transition to sustainable consumption and production. And the Swedish experience that we're hearing from Emma, it is a debate that it's being heard in each and every country that has adopted a sustainable consumption and production strategy. So far, and whether this can be called circular economy, green economy, any label that we give it, as long as it meets certain criteria and certain elements, uh, it is counted towards the achievement of SDG 12. However, we are leaving behind, and this is an important dimension, over 80 countries or 90 that don't yet have an appropriate national framework to help them make these decisions and take these approaches. The third one, in one way or the other, what we're hearing, and it is really important to hear this national experience, is the system approach. When we work with countries, what we are trying is to move from the, the vision on sectors towards systems because then it allows to connect the impacts at their source, but also to look at the connection between climate, biodiversity and pollution. And today we hear it. This is the debate that we're seeing. And last but not least, the countries that we are working with are looking into the role of consumers and how can we create good public policies that do not distort consumer choices. So to answer your question, yes, in one uh, stage, or another, all countries are looking into sustainable consumption and production, yet the gap is tremendous. And there is a incredible need for countries like Sweden that are taking this absolutely honest leadership through the approach of a generational goal to track their consumption and their footprint, not only nationally, but globally, to see how can this experience be replicated and help countries advance in their own development path. So yes, this debate is absolutely universal from a parliamentary perspective or from a, a, a decision maker perspective. But what it's lacking in many cases is the capacity to absorb these tools and to make adequate decisions on the basis of data. Thank you very much. Can I can I follow up with uh, Emma? Um, is, is the, fo the focus now, I guess a part of the focus is, is whether you should have consumption based climate targets and how that should be framed. Or will you also suggest policies to to implement these uh, targets and to support these targets? Uh, yeah, we have a. Our job is to come up with a strategy. So of course it's the implementation, and everything, and it's also, I mean, how how would we achieve the goals? So we will also have suggestions in different areas from, uh, yeah, uh, building transportation, 
food and consumption and so on. So it, we will try to cover all the areas that we can and see that this is what we agreed upon. We can do this and we will re hopefully reach the goals that we will set up. So we are looking in all the different areas and hopefully the strategy will be a, a path how to, to make sure that we will achieve our goals. Thank you. Uh, can I can I ask Eva? You mentioned um, um, that the Prince results can be used in the uh, follow up of the environmental quality objectives. Um, so far, the discussion has been mostly on the climate related uh, targets. But can you say a few more words about how it can be used for other environmental quality objectives as well? Mm, it's it's really hard for me to foresee at the moment because we just kicked off the, the evaluation. So, but it's um, I don't think there are any restrictions. I mean, all the useful findings should be applied in in the follow up uh, in depth evaluation and the follow up as you has pre uh, have presented today. If I think about other things where the Prince results can be used, uh, uh, Horge uh, was mentioning this SCP hotspot analysis tool. And um, uh, I think the Prince uh, results and especially the data that has been developed during the years should be, it's possible to use and, and to uh, put in national data in the tool today already. So that is definitely something we need to do in order to find out if if the <clears throat> if the figures for Sweden are uh, accurate according to our own studies. So that would be a very interesting next step. And another important thing I want to raise is really this collaboration and the need for a strong evidence base in the further development of these uh, consumption goals and the consumption strategies. And I, I really think that the PRINCE project and the close collaboration between Statistics Sweden, the Swedish EPA and the researchers in the field has been uh, really necessary in order to take those steps and it becomes even more evident uh, in the global, at the global level in the work with a value chain uh, approach which is a new methodology developed in cooperation with the integrated resource panel and the uh, One Planet Network, where it, it's really, really important to look further into science in, in order to be able to develop these kind of policy approaches. So, um, yeah, and I also think the, the indicators you have de developed could be further used within international indicator systems, such as the uh, 10 YFP uh, framework or well, indicator framework. So we should also look into that in the future. So that's uh, some thoughts I had. And as also, as was mentioned, we need really to uh, keep in mind that there are really different needs all over the world. We are talking a lot of overconsumption, but there is also a huge under consumption globally. So it's all the, the, the basis is needed, but how it is, will be used is, of course, very dependent on the different countries and stakeholders. Thank you very much. And uh, we need to finish this panel now. Um, thank you very much to all three of you for, for your valuable contributions. Um, personally, I worked in both in PRINCE 1 and PRINCE 2, so I really appreciate hearing how the results can be used in different contexts. So thank you all, uh, and I will now hand over to Osa Persson again, um, Deputy Director at Stockholm Environment Institute for some closing remarks. Thank you, Jöran, and uh, really a, a big thank you to all the um, researchers presenting their findings. Uh, incredibly interesting, and for me as a non-expert, it was uh, particularly interesting to see and hear about all this progress on non-climate uh, issues and, and footprints, uh, biodiversity, air pollution, chemicals, because of course we know that these uh, are problems that are, are killing many people today. It's not just about that sort of uh, future threat. So uh, 
Very exciting. And, and also, of course, a very warm thank you to the panelists. Uh, you raised a, a number of important issues there because the, the data and the research is, of course, only the first step. Um, we heard about the need to move forward uh, globally in a um, uh, in solidarity. Uh, of course, this, these are huge issues for many countries that are uh, dependent on, on uh, exports. And sustainable development is really about combining the environmental, social and economic pillars. So a very important message. We also heard that it takes time to, to develop policy uh, based on this data. And we heard that it's also important to consider uh, issues of justice and fairness among consumers here in Sweden to, to, to really um, uh, make more significant change. Um, I what one take home message for me was that actually some trends are moving in the right direction. Uh, this was encouraging, uh, but uh, most likely not fast enough. Um, but also uh, so, some more specific uh, issues, which I think are very interesting for us uh, at SEI and with our partners to take forward in, in future research, maybe a Prince 3 or, or other projects. Um, First, learning more about these hotspots, I was surprised to hear that uh, EU is indeed a hotspot for, for Sweden. For example, the water footprint in Spain is, a, is an issue for Swedish consumption. I think this sort of challenges that image we have that uh, these hotspots are in China or in uh, Brazil, Indonesia, elsewhere. And this can really um, also have some political significance, I think, in the future. Uh, another uh, very important issue, the absorption capacity raised by Jorge. Uh, how do we make use of all this data and how can we as uh, researchers based in Sweden also support colleagues um, in other countries to, to try to bridge the science policy gap in this field? Uh, finally, uh, it was encouraging to see some more recent data because I know there has been issues around the, the time lag when constructing these footprints and that we have to work with old data, which is of course also a problem when we need to speed up um, the, the sustainability transition we have ahead of us. Uh, but overall, I think lots of uh, food, food for thought and also lots of wisdom on how to um, move forward in bridging the science policy gap when it comes to sustainable consumption, which we indeed hope we will be discussing much more at Stockholm Plus 50 next year. Thank you. And I hand over to Nils Brown, I believe. Yeah, thank you very much, also, and uh, thank you very much to uh, our panelists uh, and to uh, the experts in the Prince team, and thank you to Joran for chairing the panel discussion. I agree that it's been um, a really interesting uh, group of people that have uh, come together here, uh, and I think I had a look at the uh, list of attendees uh, last night, and I think um, what I noticed is we have attendees from uh, public um, public authorities. Um, here in Sweden, um, of course, from the uh, Swedish Environmental Protection Agency, but also from public authorities far beyond uh, this specific environmental field, um, uh, going into uh, procurement, going into matters of uh, consumer issues. And I think that really uh, underlines uh, the significance of uh, the data that we're producing with a consumption perspective, because it appeals to a broad range of stakeholders. Not only do we have national um, policy makers, but we have policy makers at local levels uh, in the Swedish municipalities as well. Uh, so that's fantastic. And on top of that, uh, it's great to see that we've got attendees from uh, public institutions uh, and authorities um, in Europe and around the world, and in particular from statistical offices. And it's great uh, that you could attend to um, be able to keep abreast of the, the work that we've been, we've been doing here. Uh, I think the project team has also underlined uh, a really significant value in the fact that we at Statistics Sweden for, in producing official, official statistics have had the opportunity uh, to rely uh, on and make use of um, the incredible knowledge that we get from our partners at uh, Stockholm Environment Institute, uh, Chalmers Institute uh, of Technology, KTH Institute of Technology, and also the Norwegian University of Science and Technology. Um, uh, and with that, as it says on the uh, as it says on uh, the slide here, uh, we will be uh, publishing a final report which will come out in the spring. Um, alongside that, I'm very happy to see that we have a, connect, a link to the new website, which has been uh, updated in the autumn, uh, where you can find more 
uh, information and results about the work that we've, we've been doing. And alongside the launch of the report, we'll also be uh, coming out with a film which will be summarizing um, in a format um, easily communicated on YouTube to uh, the results of the work that we've been produced. So um, on that note, uh, very warm thanks to everybody. And finally, thanks to uh, Stockholm Environment Institute and their team behind the scenes um, who have been uh, valuable uh, in helping um, the proceedings go as, smooth, as smoothly as they have today. So Ian Caldwell, Bernie Ara and Ilver Ilanda, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, thank you very much for listening. If you have any further questions, please don't hesitate to contact me or any other member of the Prince team. You can con you have my email address there on the slide. Uh, so do send me an email. And if it is a question of one of our experts, um, I can forward it on to them. Um, so thank you very much, everybody. Goodbye.